So you guys like that? Yeah. Still feeling that 7 p.m. excitement after the wait in line? You ready for some guests? I see a hat. I still see a hat. Okay, so <laughs> we are so, so, so thrilled, pleased, excited to have um, the creative team behind this film. Uh, first, I'm going to bring out the screenwriter and director. It's so nice to have him back making films, Bruce Robinson. Welcome to the University of Texas. Thank you very much. And now... <laughs> John Wayne's coming. John... <laughs> you have to pick up your mic. It's the next thing that's in now. Okay. And now, the producer and star of the picture, Rum Diary, Johnny Depp. <laughs> Hi, how, <laughs> how you guys doing? Thanks for, uh, thanks for watching, thanks for coming. We will, we will talk for a little bit. They will have some questions here in the room live, and then if you look in front of you and below, there will be some texted questions from around the country. Oh. Everyone understand the drill here? And away we go. So, this is a crowd of students. Everyone here has really grown up on your films, Johnny. They're like your kids. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> he thought it was masturbation. <laughs> uh, sorry. But maybe... No, he didn't say a bad word. He didn't. He didn't. But maybe they are... mastication? Is that what it was? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But maybe they are not as familiar with the work of Hunter S. Thompson. Um, so you're in an interesting situation with this film because you've done something out of your feelings and your passion yeah. to try to make sure that that legacy continues with a younger generation that's more familiar with you than with him. And you recruited a fine director who hadn't worked in a while to be your collaborator on this. So I said ahead of time, it's a three-way collaboration, Bruce Robinson, Johnny Depp, and the spirit of Hunter Thompson. The question is, what is it, in terms of Hunter, that you'd like everybody here in the room to sort of take away from this film? And or what is it that you'd like them to think about acting differently after they see this film, which is really his origin story, to be precise about it, because leaving Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is 10 years later, yep. to give the time. I mean, basically, uh, um, if any of you can take anything away with regard to Hunter, uh, walk away with something, um, understand that um, the voice that he eventually found, which was his own, um, was one of the most important and um, a, a voice that still resonates, I mean, still reverberates and ping-pongs around to this day and will continue to and should because he, he, the voice that he found was his own and the voice that he had was one of rage and it wasn't out of hatred. What Hunter, the things that Hunter wrote were not out of hatred or, or, um, or, 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 or sort of menace. It was, it was really more like, um, it was a guy that cared so much that he had to rail against the authority that were, s s you know, sort of pushing him, pushing the world, you know, back into its little corner. And uh, Hunter is, uh, is, and always will be that sort of um, rage against, well, society or the machine or whatever it is, you know. And Bruce, do you want to? Yeah. Um, 
Uh, my view of Hunter uh, uh, is now and was then, you know, the dirty, rotten bastards who run this place um, were his enemy. And uh, I felt an incredible affinity to him um, living in England, uh, where obviously I do. And, and the first time I read Hunter S. Thompson, I thought, Jesus Christ, here is somebody who, who, who is like me in a sense. And I, I'm not, obviously, I'm not Hunter, but I, I, uh, I shared his passion and his rage for the crooks, you know, or anti the crooks. And uh, so when Johnny sort of dragged me out of uh, what you call retirement, um, which he did. Basically the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> he got me years. out. I mean, you know, I, I really genuinely and honestly never thought I'd ever make another film in my life. And then he was on my case and, you know, slightly following me around a bit and saying, you're doing this. <laughs> and so... I remember one day saying, all right, I will. Uh, the, th the thing about Hunter is, is I keep getting feedback from here. Have I got feedback? Feedback? <laughs> feedback, I'm hearing my voice like I'm sitting over there in the fucking row J7 or something. <laughs> you want to switch with that person? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, have this one. <laughs> oh, no, all right. Yeah. Oh, that's better, isn't it? Isn't it? Can you hear me? He made me do it. <laughs> he fucking made me do it. <laughs> and I really genuinely had no aspiration ever to do it again. And, and he made me, he, he just, he was on my case and, and sucked me back into uh, being, a, being a filmmaker. For both of you, what would Hunter... That didn't answer anyone's fucking question, did it? No, no, you, d you, <laughs> you did, and don't worry about it if you didn't, but you did. What would Hunter make of Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Austin, Occupy wherever you happen to be in the United States right now if you were alive? As far as I'm concerned, I mean, it's the same, exactly the same in my country, in England. We, I, I am a complete... Um, I was going to say an ascetic. I'm an atheist. I have no God. I genuinely don't have a God. But I would rather have a God than the deity of money. And uh, wh what the problem is for all of us now is that we're kneeling to this bloody money, you know. And uh, that, I, I'm pleased to say, is kind of collided with, with, with the movie w we made. And... Um, <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> no, no, Hunter, w Hunter would be, I think, uh, at this point in time, you know, were he uh, physically here, he would be doing Snoopy dances, you know. Would he? Absolutely. Would you like me to show you what that yeah, is? Yeah, do a Snoopy dance. No, don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> Please don't. No, no, I, I mustn't. It's just a, No, because once I start, I can't stop. That's the problem. <laughs> it's just that Hunter celebrated the morality of humanity. I must humanity. have this cord. Yeah, they've got oh, it, it's I'm being bound <laughs> here. <laughs> it's literally stable to the chair, Is so it? that's not going to work. Well, I think you've got to swap. You have that one, then. I think you better swap back. Well, or you have that one. No, is it gonna Hello? He Hello? celebrated... Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, no. all right. Hello? He celebrated the morality of humanity... And that is the thing that really stuck to me when Johnny asked me to have a go at this book. I read the book, and <coughs> I can't write like him. I don't want to write like him, but I did, I did feel that great engine of rage and morality that Hunter Thompson represented, and that's what I hope we got in our film. And we did. And we did. Did we? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Johnny, everybody loves, well, I shouldn't say it that way. You re were recently quoted in the current issue of Vanity Fair as saying, presumably referring to Captain Jack Sparrow, if people want to pay me the stupid money, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and take the stupid money. I assume that's partly because that enables you to do something like Rum Diary, something that's a passion project for you. Is that accurate? 
I mean, basically, uh, y y you know, when I when I said that, it the the actual quote should have been, you know, the stupid money should have been in quotations because, I mean, let's face it, is a ridiculous amount of money that they want to pay an actor to go out there and pretend. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and, and that, so, I mean, so it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I mean, I said that I I in a sense, it was like, you know, it was somewhat sort of, uh, you know, self-deprecating in a, in a sense, because I, I find it ridiculous. I find it stupid. I find it stupid that they spend that much money on these, on these movies, you know. I, I really do. I, fi I find it um, quite absurd. But, so the quote was, if they want to pay me that, if they want to give me that money, to do this stuff without selling out, or without you know, uh, uh, you know, giving away any sort of degree of integrity, or or you know, it, it's just for a character that I invented, okay, or I play. Cool, that's fine, and that goes to the kids, my kiddies, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it. What are you going to do? Say, oh, you know what? I'd actually, you know what? I'd prefer half that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really rather not. You know what? I'd rather not have that. Actually, <laughs> but I'll do it for free. <laughs> Why no. would you? Why would anyone? <laughs> but does it empower and enable you to be able to do something like Rum Diary and be a producer as well, which I think you maybe you're doing more of? Most definitely. Listen, I, you know, I had, my entire career was based on 20 years of failures, essentially, you know, from, from Cry Baby to Edward Scissorhands to Ed Wood to Benny and June to whatever, I mean, they w these were not like groundbreaking, money-making, you know, huge Hollywood things, you know, they, they Hollywood the, or the, the powers that be in Hollywood were sort of sitting on the edge of their seats going, is his movie going to make money, you know, this time? Is he going to, oh God, will we have to put him on the list? And they never did, you know, and it wasn't until like Sleepy Hollow made, I don't know, a few bucks for them. And then Pirates happened, you know. And Pirates was essentially when, I, when Captain Jack Sparrow uh, uh, came into my life, it was 2003 and it was like um, sort of any other character I'd played, you know. It, it was the same process, the same whole thing. And, um, and then, it, it, then things have been weird since. <laughs> <laughs> Let me rephrase one last time, but would you like to do more of this, or is it just a, a confluence of extreme circumstances that makes you want to do Rum Diary and Honor Hunter and work with Bruce, or is this like now? No, like no, absolutely. Listen, uh, uh, there are things that you, that you feel great passion for, certainly uh, the Rum Diary. I mean, it, 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 it was born uh, you know, out of a cardboard box that I opened up in Hunter's basement in 1997, and now we're you know, what are we, 14 years down the line or something, you know? And we finally, finally got the dough, got the dream, and got it made. So that is a, um, a great uh, passion. And uh, it's, it's really wonderful to get, get there. Um, when you do things also like the Libertine, um, which is a, another great passion of mine, um, there has to be some sort of balance, you know? I mean, and you also have to be able to uh, take a swat back at Hollywood. You must, you know? You must sort of keep, when they accept you, you gotta sort of say, no, 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 I must infiltrate the enemy camp. I must dive into something, you know, deeper than what you've got. Um, I'm being, we're our monitor is giving us a question. I'm going to go over to this, but I have to ask you one last thing about those earlier days, since uh, What's Eating Gilbert Grape was actually shot here in Austin. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And it's a film that's held up remarkably well. Um, what, um, what's different about Austin between then and now? I actually don't recognize it anymore, you know. <coughs> it was such a long time ago. That was um, 91 or 2, or something like that. Uh, yeah, Austin has most definitely grown up, you know. When you, when you go around 6th Street, you go, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have some semblance of memory of this. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, when you get around the outskirts, it's really grown up, you know. It's become a kind of, it's really spread out. But 
I had a great, great experience here and fell in love with this place uh, all, all those years ago and uh, made great friends, uh, you know, from, from, you know, Gibby Haynes and the Butthole Surfers to, uh, to, uh, to Bill Carter and, uh, and uh, his wife Ruth. And I, I've, I've uh, no, I've always loved this, this, this joint. So, <laughs> are we starting with questions in the room, or are we going uh, overseas here? Yeah. You okay. Go ahead. Overseas. Please. We're going to Since Nigeria. She's she's going to ask this question uh, on the left here. Uh, as close to Hunter S. Thompson as I can get. I was just curious. You once have a, you've been quoted saying that you have to put a little bit of yourself into your work, otherwise it's like lying. Yeah. Um, how do you, how would you think he would respond to objectivity in journalism? Is there more merit in putting yourself in interjecting doing the gonzo journalism, or should you really still try to do the balance view? Because that's a problem I've been having in writing. I think Hunter found m my opinion. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm kind of speaking out of out of turn in a sense, bec because Hunter should really answer that. But I mean, I he was someone that I um, knew very well, and I worshipped, and um, we had a great uh, great friendship. I think Hunter, because he, you know, from the outside, you could look at it and say. He's raging against everything because he hates it. The, the, the situation was that he was so hyper, hypersensitive that he cared very deeply. He cared very much. And that was sort of what drove him. And that's what created that rage. Um, and I think that Hunter found a safety net in the kind of the invention of God bless you. <laughs> she raised her hand. <laughs> well done. <laughs> or Gesundheit, whichever you prefer. You know. I think that Hunter found a safety net in uh, creating that that Raoul Duke character, if you will. You know, the idea that, that that of putting himself into the story. You know, after he'd been you know beaten and mauled by the Hell's Angels. Um, where else was he going to go? You know, he, he, he found a kind of safety net in this untouchable being, which became Hunter, you know. So uh, I would say, yeah, go outside, stay inside, but go outside, and then drop it back in as Hunter did, you know. I appreciate it. Bless your heart. Thank you, Don. <coughs> we coming to the right? Hello, Mr. Depp. My name is Judy Serrano, and I'm a reporter with the Daily Texan. That's the student newspaper here on campus. And um, I've been trying to talk to you for three days, but everyone else has told me no. So I would well, here's, really like here's your chance. Do it. I know. I've been but trying to talk like to myself for three days, <laughs> <laughs> and it hasn't okay. worked at all. Yeah. I would love five minutes after. If you could spare a few, but if not, I'm just going to take my chance right now. Um, <laughs> so. Um, just um, relating to the movie, there's been a lot of criticism on journalism in the last few years and accusations that, so, that journalism is biased. Do you think that journalism has lost its way since Hunter Thompson's time? And what do you think needs to be done about it? Yeah, he was so unbiased. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think, I think the problem is now it's become big business, essentially. You know, I mean, it's, it's really on, on par with, you know, all the the sort of things that that, 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 you know, all these, the kids at, you know, Wall Street, you know, go on the bridge or occupy Wall Street or occupy whatever. Um, I think it's become big business. I think it's become some semblance of a, um, you know, like a uh, product. And um, it's not really about selling the truth or telling the truth. It's really more about Inventing something that the, that, that the people want to, would, you know, buy, or or what they'll, what can we shove down their throats that they'll buy? So no, I think it's, I think journalism is in a bad state right now, and I think Hunter would agree, most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I completely second that. I, you know, when I was a kid, when I grew up, um, is this mic working? Yeah, you can. Oh, yeah. I had. Uh, 
I mean, I'm a real old bugger and uh, <laughs> grew, grew up in England and lived in England and I have politicians shouting fear in my ears since the day I was born and they carry on doing that. And, uh, and certainly when I was, you know, uh, when I was a kid at 14, 15 years old, shouting fear and horror in my ears. And that's it, uh, that's essentially it. Yeah, that's forever. Yes. And, and telling me that uh, there were two newspapers in, in Russia that we were made a, a w aware of, and I'm not a fucking communist, for Christ's sake, but <laughs> I mean, there was uh, a, a newspaper called Izvestia and another one called Pravda in, in uh, Russia. And I remember my school teacher saying to me, of course they don't tell the truth, these papers. These are communist newspapers and they don't tell people the truth. And it was a long, long time before I realized that our newspapers don't tell us anything like the truth, you know. And so, so doing this movie, that was a kind of an under you know, the hem of the film, if you like, was, was, it's all bullshit. It is all endless bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> what was that middle word? <laughs> um, flipping. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's just they, s they flood our brains with this junk. I mean, the only time you ever sort of feel comfortable in America, you know, and I'm a, a great fan of this country, but you look at the TV and the only time people are ever happy in America is in the adverts. And it's always, they're always cuddling their kids and living on a really sweet shore and the sun <laughs> setting and it's gorgeous. And everything else is fear. And, and it, it really worries me, it worries me because it's, it's happening in England too, exactly the same thing. The ads are great, and the rest is fucking terror. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, John. No, no. <laughs> well, no, well spoke. <laughs> <laughs> Let's come back to this side. Hi. Um, I guess I'm really curious as to the, um, the storytelling and creative economics of a film like this, where you have such big and powerful names being tossed around. Um, just the value of... Uh, the source of Thompson, the value of the writer of the screenplay, the value of the, the star, the value of the director, and where the storytelling, you know, the economics of where it all converges. No, no I, think, I think that's you. No, because you, you made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> you made me do it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll commence, shall I, and then uh, hand it over to Bruce, because uh, in terms of the... Um, in terms of what I was saying earlier, you know, Bruce was the dream for Hunter and I. Um, he was the only guy that we thought uh, could make this 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 uh, this this film come to life, and uh, and we were right. You know, hit the nail on the head, as it were. And um, but I mean, going through that process, just Hunter and myself, was like a ridiculous. I mean, it was ludicrous. It started around. The book was published in 98. First of all, it was written in 59, published in 98. And then we went through this entire process where, you know, like he and I sitting around with a, you know, a cache of whiskey bottles and, uh, you know, people with giant wallets coming to, coming to sort of, you know, sit with us at my pool. We were really um, not well versed in um, how to get things made, <laughs> and um, uh, it wasn't until far, far after you know Hunter made his exit that it was we were able to uh, get things happening and get Bruce on board. Um, I think you should go from there. What else are we talking about? Like? <laughs> I don't know. Who wants to know something about <laughs> I economics? Know, that's <laughs> I think it's about economics. No, I mean, <laughs> he's put me on the spot now. Can they you turn his microphone up? Because I can't hear a fucking word. <laughs> I'm curious about the interplay between all of the uh, the creative sources as to like 
how the the story finally turns out. Well, that's you, isn't it? Shall I? <laughs> no, I, I, I was Good on night. vacation <laughs> with... Uh, are you going to leave? <laughs> <laughs> I was on vacation with my, my family in Spain, in Seville, and I got this phone call, have you ever uh, read the Ram Dari, which I have to say I hadn't. And somehow Johnny or, or his blokes had found me down there, and anyway, they sent me the book, and I read the book, and I was horrified at, at the thought of going back into this b industry. Um, and the biggest problem with the book was the division that Hunter had made between himself, uh, Paul Kemp, and Yamon, and it, and it took me ages to, to to discover that, which is ridiculous, because I turned on the internet the other day in Los Angeles, and there's Hunter Thompson saying, oh, I divided myself between Yaman and Kemp. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't understand that at the time. Uh, and as soon as I did kind of come to terms with the fact that he'd split himself into two characters, then I felt I was able to, to write the thing. Uh, and I shifted the girl over to the other side of the enemy camp. Uh, I mean, this movie is Johnny's, you know. I mean, this is why I'm sitting here. I would not be here for anyone but him, you know. <laughs> well, so you, 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 you <coughs> oh, I think I'll have an asthma attack now. <laughs> <coughs> while, he's, while he's choking, um, I'll, um, I will say, you know, the, the, the in, in terms of the economics, I mean, the, the beauty w was that Bruce, when he, when he finally cracked it, and called me and said, I understand now, you know, these two characters must go into one. It's got to be Hunter. It's got to be, must be Hunter, only Hunter. Um, death? <laughs> no, he's all right. <laughs> um, Can I have some more of your coffee? I think it's gone away. Oh. Where's Nathan? Uh. Um, so, so um, his <coughs> first draft <coughs> was essentially <coughs> the shooting draft. <laughs> Do you have one? <laughs> How much? <laughs> <laughs> Can we do? You gonna charge us? <laughs> uh, free if you let me into the after party. <laughs> I'm under 21. No, you're in. No. <laughs> no. Are you one? <laughs> All right. Um, can I take one from uh, University of Washington, UW? Well, I'm uh, I'm going to. So then we'll come. Stay stay put over there. This is a this is Cassinia. I'm going to say Cassinia. Does that look right to you? Cassinia. Oh, okay. It says, how did you research the role? Now, of course, you played older Hunter Thompson. Now you're playing yeah, larger than Hunter Thompson. It was interesting, you know, because um, having, having played Raoul Duke, which is the sort of full-blown, essentially the full-blown Hunter Thompson, uh, circa 71, 72, but also, I mean, he was... He was the Hunter Thompson, you know, up until 2005, the one that I knew. Um, it was kind of a, a great challenge that Bruce and I shared, you know, how, you know, how do we approach this guy? Um, how do we approach Hunter before he found his voice? And luckily, <coughs> Hunter was so incredibly generous uh, with me uh, over those years that I, I, he gave me, you know, he, I knew him so well that he ga he gave me those you know those sort of moments he gave me uh, he told me about himself and schooled me about himself before he had found that outlet you know um, so yeah that was that was basically it, it was uh, you know the, the idea is how do you how do you um, how do you sort of trim off the edges of that kind of flamboyant character and um, and uh, find what he was like pre-freedom, you know. You were, you were able to go back to the later full-blown version a little bit in Rango as well, yes? <laughs> there was a moment or two, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's, let's stay. Oh, look. It's uh, Austin at Columbia College. That would be in Chicago, I believe. To the director. That would be you. Do you feel like you needed to live up to the infamous fear and loathing, or did you start from scratch? Uh, completely 
uh, from scratch. The, uh, one of the things you have to do as a screenwriter, uh, uh, which for my sins I am, <coughs> is read the uh, source material and throw it away because otherwise you're stuck in trying to... I mean, I'll give you an example of this, is that uh, m my favorite book on Earth is David Copperfield, and it's 900 pages long. It took Dickens two years to write, and if I was asked to write it as a flick, uh, what am I going to do? I've got 105 minutes. Um, so you have to absorb the essence of what it is you're trying to write, and, and make it your own. And certainly with, with the Ram Dari, there was no way I was going to sit there and, and in my writing room and, and think, oh, what did Hunter say here? What was this scene here? I wanted to be in the vernacular of Hunter S. Thompson, who you know, we all incredibly admire, but, but I, I couldn't try and write like him. So I read the book a couple of times, threw it away, and then wrote my version of him, of, of what I thought Hunter would be in my head when I was writing this thing. And uh, indeed, there are only literally two lines of, of the book in the, in, in the uh, film. Great lines they are, too. One is, have some fun with a fucking luger, <laughs> uh, which is uh, one of the lines. And we'll be lucky to find an oil spot when they're looking for the car. <laughs> but I, I, I had to kind of just love him, which I genuinely do as a writer. He was one of the great 20th century writers, him and old Bill Burroughs and one or two others. But uh, he was a, such a great writer, and, uh, and he really affected me as, as a writer. Um, even though I found him later in my life. <laughs> in the room, Apparently that's what he did. In the room to the right. Um, hi, thanks to both of you for being here. Uh, there were Thank many you. things that I really enjoyed about the film, but in the spirit of Hunter Thompson and uh, the rage that you're talking about, I want to, not coming? quite rage, but <laughs> I just want to ask you a little bit about something that bothered me a bit in the film, um, which was the portrait. Me. Y you, Johnny, you. Yeah. Uh, well, I had the same problem. Yeah. <laughs> Unwatchable. Yeah, I know, I know. No, um... I had the same problem with every film I do. There you go. Isn't that weird? <laughs> no, it's we about the... We should probably move in together, shouldn't we? We see What's eye that? to eye, don't we? What's that? You and I. Yep. Hey, I was an actor for a while. If Where you need a stand-in, I'm in. Are you... Uh, <laughs> this What's is, that? is this like a weird pickup? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Focus. It's not going very well. <laughs> I think it's going very well, actually. Yeah. I am intrigued. I am. Well, what is it? Um, the question is about the... Come forward, young man. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Find me afterwards. I'll be in the bathroom. Are you selling tickets? What's Something happening? About in the bathroom. <laughs> All right. Uh, somehow veering my way back on the What are you going to be doing the in the bathroom now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not um, turned okay. on anymore, by the way. What's that? I'm not turned on anymore. Okay. All Close. right, keep going. What, it was a good what? try. Okay, I want to ask you about the portrayal of Puerto Ricans in the film. Um, to me, it seemed like uh, there were a lot of violent men and sort of sexualized women. Uh, and I'm, that bothered me a bit. I'm curious what your, whether that was something you were concerned about or what your thoughts are on that. Is your feeling that the Puerto Ricans uh, portray themselves badly? No, I mean it's the Puerto Ricans in the film, because they were actually Puerto Rican actors. I actually, guess I'm just curious about, in the writing of the film, when you were creating some of those secondary characters, uh -huh. um, how did you conceive of them, and was that something that you thought about? I, th I think really the film, the film, I mean, you know, at its core is, is you know, what, what enraged Hunter was the idea of the despoilization of a paradise. You know, when Cuba for example, in 59, was no longer available to the US government. Where do they go? Puerto Rico. What's next? Let's take it. Let's take it. Let's have it. Let's chew it up. Let's churn it out. And so essentially, I mean, 
that's really what was going on. Um, but I, I don't, I, myself, I, I don't see anything in the film that is uh, misrepresentative uh, uh, to Puerto Rico or to Puerto Ricans at all. Um, I, I think it represents very, very well the, 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 the truth in the sense that this horrific capitalist monster was coming in there with, you know, gnashing teeth and, uh, and uh, it commenced around then and it's, they're still gnashing, you know. Yeah. You, know? You, just, you just shook your head when he asked the question, so do you want to comment or well, move yeah, on? Well, um, yeah, if I may. Uh, We're going to see him in the bathroom later, don't <laughs> we? Yeah, we can, we can have a follow-up discussion. <laughs> <laughs> discussion. What will he do? <laughs> Um, <coughs> the whole thing, the whole thing, the whole thing, which is the motor drive of the movie in a sense, is you know when you see West Side Story and you see these gangs in New York, um, who were basically Hispanic gangs. What happened in the 1950s is that the U.S. moved into Puerto Rico with the United Fruit Corporation, and everyone who worked there on you know pineapples or whatever it was, were thrown out of work because the equipment moved in and now it was big business. And so the Puerto Ricans suddenly found themselves after 500 years having no jobs, nothing to do. They couldn't do the fruit anymore and, and then they moved to New York and th that is uh, West Side Story, you know. And then it's the same thing in England, you know. We fuck them up and then they come over here to our country and then we kind of are critical of them finding work in our country. And that's exactly what happened in Puerto Rico. It was, uh, it was a very, very bad time in the 50s and 60s for the Puerto Ricans, you know. They were really torn to bits as a society. Anyway, fuck it. I'm <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> do you, do He's you made me have coffee too. Do you think this is too much of a repeat here from Trey Morgan at Fort Hayes State University, or you want to? Um. We can all vote on this. Do it we want to take I mean the Fort Hayes State University question? How is your approach to portray a younger Hunter S. Thompson different than your previous portrayal in Fear and Loathing? Was it more challenging this time? I, th I think we've covered the ground, but I mean, it, uh, of course, yeah, it was infinitely more challenging because it was a kind of a, a version or a sliver of Hunter that I had to um, discover, you know, uh, after he'd uh, already made his exit, you know. So over to this side. Uh, hi. I have a question for uh, Mr. Robinson. What's um, uh, one of the most important things in screenwriting you think anyone interested in getting into the field should know and consider when writing? You should all see and read with Noel and I, for starters. Oh, that is people complete. have. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that, 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 that's, I'm oh, sorry. With Noel and I is, is, is uh, I swear to you, like uh, in the top three films of, of my absolute all-time favorites, you know, up there with, with uh, To Have and Have Not and, uh, and uh, Time of the Gypsies, With Noel and I is a must-see and, and uh, if you guys don't have a copy, I'll, 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 I'll send each one of you one. Oh, it's an Oprah moment. Okay. <laughs> Not a car for everybody, but a And you know what? <laughs> I'm, I'll make coffee in the morning as well as waffles. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, she's looking for screenwriting oh. guru tips. Oh. I'm sorry. That made, I didn't mean to. It's a good no, question. No, no. It is a good question. Um, Christ, what do I do? The only thing I do when I try and write a script is to see it as a big picture and I have a big a wall in my writing room where I just write down ideas all the time. Then I suffer because it's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, it's a real underrated craft in my view and it's incredibly difficult to, to do but I do it in... Uh, in basically three acts. There was a fantastic American writer 
whose name escapes me. I'll get to it when I get to what he said. Uh, he said all, all uh, screenplays are the same thing. Put a man up a tree, throw rocks at him, bring him down the tree, one, two, three acts. And that's what I always ad adhere to. Who, who said that, John? You have no idea? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. But I, like I think I may have made it up. <laughs> I think Bruce Robinson said that, actually. Thank you. Well oh. done, yeah. Over to the right. Hi. Uh, first thing, I wanted to thank you all for coming to Austin. Um, my question digresses a bit from the previous questions, but um, Mr. Depp, personally, my favorite roles that you've played are um, the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland, Sweeney Todd, and Edward Scissorhands. Um, and I wanted to know which, out of these three roles, which one did you enjoy the most? And what was your main inspiration behind these roles? Do you, and before you answer her... By the way, it's S.J. Perlman said that. There you go. S.J. Perlman. <laughs> good call, good call. See? <laughs> before, as you answer this, again, you say you, you do not like to watch yourself acting, but now you're a producer, so don't you have to watch the films you produce? Like, for example, this one. And, and also, is it true that you truly, a absolutely can't watch yourself in 3D because you don't watch 3D? I can't see in 3D. I literally cannot. I've, I've never seen anything in my life in 3D because I have a, a gamey left eye. Okay. <laughs> we confer? No, but like for real. A rumor confirmed? Kind of for real. Okay. Now, um, now to her question. Um, you and I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't. Are you going to smoke? Do you think I should? Are you going to? Are you threatening me? <laughs> <laughs> he wants me to light this thing on fire. <laughs> it's probably a bad idea, isn't it? <laughs> I have no responsibility. Do what you want. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> that might be. <laughs> This night might be over in about 30 seconds, people. <laughs> We're going to be fine. No, he made us do it. <laughs> We're going to be fine because, uh, Christ, we're adults, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to be fine. So, so um, I don't, I don't uh, actually like to, I, don't, I can't stand watching myself it's, uh, on film. It, it just makes me, uh, I don't know. I, I, what I like is the, I like the process. I enjoy the process. I enjoy the work. I enjoy the sort of collaborative effort. And um, that's really what it's all about for me. In terms of the films you speak about, like Sweeney, which was uh, quite a challenge, or Edward Scissorhands, um, without question, Edward Scissorhands for me was the most important thing I've ever done to date because it, um, it helped me, you know, after I'd done um, Cry Baby with John Waters, which was a, you know, it was a, it was a move, a conscious maneuver on my part, in a sense that after they'd, they'd offered me these horrible things, with, you know, like, where you just carry guns and dry hump some young woman, <laughs> which is not a bad thing, <laughs> per se, <coughs> but um, in the context of cinema, I just felt, you know, it might have been done one or two times prior. So uh, Cry Baby was a step forward in a direction that I knew I wanted to go. Edward Scissorhands was, for me, uh, the dream because it was like solidifying, you know, it was like I was suddenly, I was on solid ground. And no matter what happened after that film, I had I had made my statement in terms of cinema. I'd done Cry Baby. I'd done Edward Scissorhands. And if I had to go back to being a gas station attendant, that was fine to do that, you know. Um, and I was, I thought it was going to happen, and it still might. <laughs> but um, you know, I was well prepared for it. So, in terms of your question, I think yes, yeah, Scissorhands was was without a doubt the uh, the most important thing I've ever done. Thank you. Thanks. Why so do the microphones go? Uh, it's good. It's all good. Is it? Yeah. So un uncredited name, uncredited school. Phoenix, Arizona wants to know. Pretty much a similar question again, but I'll read it off. Another Hunter S. Thompson work. 
what influence has he had on your development and or influence as an artist slash human? Human. Human. Well, there's a, there's a problem there already. <laughs> um, I mean, Hunter, Hunter had a, a profound effect on me as a human being, certainly, uh, um, and as an artist. If I can call myself an artist, I'm not sure I can, but Hunter was one of those things, you know, the uncompromising, uh, straight, straight to the, the heart of the matter, um, no bullshit, just full on, you know, no turning back into the center of the, uh, the storm. Um, so I, I mean, he was a great influence on me and still is to this day, you know, I, um, it's been, um, Christ almighty, it's been six years. I wake up with him every day and I put my head on the pillow every night and he's with me. Yeah, so and uh, certainly as far as I'm concerned. Um, <coughs> the thing that Hunter did for me as a writer was teach me not to use adjectives. You know, it was a golden gossamer marigold dawn. <laughs> no, it was dawn. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I really learned that from Hunter. And even though <coughs> the thing that you guys never heard of uh, <coughs> is, is this thing with Nell and I, it was written it was actually written before of Fear and Loathing, and then, and then when a, a flatmate of mine gave me Fear and Loathing to read, it was a, a total revelation to me that, that was someone was writing without adjectives and just hit that point always. And he's still a, a real influence on me as a writer. And uh, I hate the word, the B-L-O-C-K word. But uh, sometimes when I feel B L O C K E D, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll pull out a bit of pull out a bit of Hunter and see how it's done. <coughs> he was a phenomenal writer, a really genuinely important American writer, and the only person since Mark Twain who had shoved himself into the actual narrative of his reporting. And he's going to last this man, you know. He's quite extraordinary man, I think. You, yep. you, hold on one sec. He's telling me what to do, but I'm disobeying. On the Gonzo, the Hunter Thompson documentary, you're, you're, you're in it as the narrator. Um, you read a bunch of the work, and I think you were instrumental, basically, in just getting the film made. Um, so uh, would you recommend that uh, if people want to have a an arm's length experience of the man and the work, is that a good, is that a good viewing experience? Oh, that's great. No, that's a, uh, uh, the Alex Gidney film, um, Gonzo, is, is uh, a great source of Hunter. I mean, it's, it's pure Hunter, and uh, it was made out of love and respect, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the filmmakers got it. Um, in a, in a large way, because as Bruce said, you know, Hunter Thompson is, is one of the, for me and for many, is one of the most important writers of the, uh, of the 20th century. And um, because he made his exit in the, the 21st, um, he, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, that, that's, he, he, uh, he dictated the way he would live and he dictated the way he would die, and um, and that's okay by me, you know. Um, but the most important thing is that his legacy lives on, and, and that people read the work because it is unique. It is uh, as important as for me as Baudelaire or Poe or um, uh, Burroughs or Kerouac, you know. This is going to be the last question in the room. Hi. I, I'm so inspired by your journey and the courage that you had um, going from a guitarist to an actor and um, oh my God, just taking, um, just progressing in your career um, constantly. And um, I don't know, I just respect so much that creativity that you have 
And I just really wanted to know, when is the next time that we can see you um, writing um, and doing more and producing more of like your own work and kind of just concentrating your own creativity? And also, uh, where do you get your hats? Because I can't find them anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a few. And uh, if you want to, I'll send you a hat for sure. If you, if you would give me your address? If you give me your address. <laughs> if you, yeah, no, if you write it down, I'll, I swear, I'll send you, I'll send you a, yeah. I'll be, ha I'll be happy to, yeah. <laughs> no, I'd be so glad in, to, yeah. In some cases, the meek shall not inherit the earth, the bold shall inherit a hat. <laughs> um, there's a thing, you know, I, I don't know what it is, and, and Bruce... Most of you will probably understand this, and, and Bruce certainly does. You know, the uh, the brain needs to be occupied um, at all times because it's uh, otherwise it's a feral beast. <laughs> you know, we must deal with it, and we must uh, acknowledge it, and we whatever outlet there is, whether it's acting. I mean, I I stumbled upon acting. I, I, I literally did, and I, I didn't, uh, that was not um, a conscious decision early on. I didn't want to be an actor. I was a musician and uh, a guitar player, and that's all I wanted to be. I didn't want uh, spotlights. I didn't want attention. I didn't want anything. You know, I asked for nothing. I just wanted to play the guitar. Cool. <laughs> Can you all see her hand? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> what have you done? <laughs> what have you done? I just made friends. <laughs> oh, you made a date? <laughs> you made a date? No, the reality about Johnny is, I've got to say this, I don't mind saying it with him because I probably, <clears throat> I don't know, I couldn't give one damn about doing this again. Because I, I did the film with Johnny because of, of uh, who he is. Uh, he is a remarkable artist, you know, and none of you guys know probably, well, a few of you probably know how great a musician he is. He's an incredible musician. And he's also an incredible painter, you know. I've <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I have this enormous picture in my, uh, I in my home in England that he gave me of, of Keith Richard that is painted on uh, cigarette papers. It's about six feet by six feet. It's just a really beautiful piece of art. He's, he's the reason we're here. Is he not? <laughs> and and that's, that's the reason I did it, with him. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, it's... You're right. You're <laughs> <absolutely> right. <laughs> we, we, we have come to an end, which you've been asking to do for the last 20 minutes, so... Yeah. Um, no, I don't like all of this stuff. Well, you, well you've, you've done very well for not liking it. We're, we're, we're going to sign off to our friends on the DepNet all over America. DepNet. Yeah, and uh, come back and we'll give you an honorary degree sometime if you want. You know what? That'd be cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, you know, would, wouldn't that be great for a high school dropout to get an honorary degree? I can that, be a that doctor. That would be great. Okay, yeah. Rum Diary is opening next Friday. Tell everybody you know to see it and see it yourselves again. And thank you, Johnny Depp, thank and you. thank you, Bruce Robinson. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much.